so so everybody i'm sure has heard of the academic and activist movement that presumptuously calls itself social justice but as well as sort of seeing these symptoms it can be really quite difficult to get your head around how it works it really is a, a particular mindset and a, a world view that that is counterintuitive so we've heard a lot recently about about critical race theory and privilege and white fragility diversity training because of um, the the recent executive or Donald Trump um but what is this people uh, seem to be showing a great deal of confusion about what critical race theory is and isn't and intersectionality is that a productive looking at different levels of marginalized identity or are the critics who call it oppression olympics actually have a point and the drive to decolonize everything including things that aren't actually colonized what is this about is science really a white western male way of knowing or is it a superior form of knowledge production that belongs to everybody and then we have cis normativity and cis sexism do we all have to give our pronouns and respect other people's pronouns how can there be a female penis and are straight men and lesbians morally obliged to be attracted to them so all of these ideas are really quite confusing and counterintuitive and and this isn't actually a design flaw it's part of how the system works the aim is to rethink all of the cases that we have held as true and assumptions that have served us in the past in order to restructure society more justly these rules change constantly so because of this it is clearly one that there are increasingly harsh penalties for saying the wrong thing firing social media dog piles public shaming reputation destruction and can all, all come from simply saying thing even when possible what was the right thing a year ago might be extremely problematic today even if we were able to keep entirely up to date with the social justice um ideology should we have to jim and i generally can keep up with a full time job and consequently is receiving nicked uh, appeals from institutions businesses and individuals who are terrified of trying to navigate their way through it and saying the wrong thing and and having seriously severe consequences fall upon them doing that is this really acceptable in a allegedly liberal way and we think about how this one ideology has managed to bypass and expectations that individuals should have freedom of belief and freedom of speech so there are ways to address this and and Jill look at those but first you need to understand how it works and that's what i'm here for So where did these ideas come from? This is a complicated question and people will argue about it for for ages. I'm not going to go into it in huge amounts of depth. But it social justice has a lot of roots. So in the first place it has some root in Marxism. We can see the impact of Marxist revolutionary zeal and the conflict theory that um, that is a theory is right center and the idea of false consciousness but if you try to treat social justice as a straightforward expansion of marxism you're not going to be very effective and what about the frankfurt school and those who call themselves or post marxists they have some impact we can see the aim to transform institutions from the um from the ideas of marcuse and we see the idea uh, of hegemony where certain ideas get great political power in a society which comes from gramsci however this is not the whole story either the political new left the revolutionary movement that that was at its height in the 70s has certainly given a lot of its spirit and fire to some of the radical activism that we see particularly the black lives matter movement but the ideas that underlie that are different in ways that it's essential to understand a lot of the theorists and um, activists now will tell you that they're simply continuing the civil rights movement the liberal feminism and gay pride but that 
that claim doesn't stand up when we look at how it is working. The current activists are not demanding that we judge each other by the contents of our character instead of the colour of our skin. They're not asking that women simply have the same opportunities as men in a liberal society, and they're not suggesting society needs to set that some people are gay and get over it. Quite often they're doing the exact opposite of this liberal tolerant approach. So to understand the worldview that is underlying the scholarship and activism we see right now, we need to have a strong understanding of some key postmodern concepts of knowledge, power and language. So postmodernism, when it arose, it arose as a scepticism towards meta-narratives. So all those low, large overarching explanations for society, including Christianity, traditional Marxism, but also science, reason, liberalism, and the very concept of progress, these meta-narratives, according to the postmodernists, need to be deconstructed. So postmodernists are essentially those who are skeptical of the developments over the modern period into liberal secular democracies. At this point in the late 1960s, the original postmodernists were quite despairing. Marxism, the main framework of the left, had failed. There were a lot of dramatic social changes going on. There was an insecurity and a feeling we trust anything anymore. This led to some quite bizarre theorizing, but for our there are two principles of and four themes that need to be understood of how. So we worked out what we call the postmodern knowledge principle, that there is native knowledge, that knowledge is something that has been constructed by any society in any historical period, and it does so in order to serve the purposes of power. That ties in to modern political principle, which holds that society is essentially a structure of systems of power and privilege. And these can be called things like white supremacy, patriarchy, cis-normativity. Now, anyway, so we have this political and knowledge principles which are working together to present us with this worldview of a society in which powerful forces get to decide is true. They then um, legitimate this knowledge, which is accepted by society in these uh, oppressive discourses of power, a circulated one throughout. This throws up a, a few common themes that we still see in all of the scholarship today. Firstly, there is the, the blurring of boundaries and the dis dismantlement of categories. If knowledge is a construct, of society, then it's constructed in categories of uh, categories and boundaries for, for understanding things, reason and emotion, some fiction, male and male. These need to be broken down in order to try to create a fairer and more just society in these theories. There's the intense focus on language because language has such a powerful constructive force. It becomes central to look cynically and quite neurotically at language on the level of the word and to think about what can and cannot be said in terms of power dynamics. So there's relativism, cultural relativism and standpoint epistemology is, is, is a central um, recurring theme. So with cultural relativism, we have the idea that it, if knowledge, if morality is all a social construct, no culture can be better or worse than any other. And also within a society, we get the idea that knowledge is sorry that knowledge is connected to um, identity. So we have subcultures, we have knowledge that belongs to black people, we have knowledge that belongs to trans people, and this cannot be um, spoken about from any other group, group but from any other other direction. We have to stay in it, as it were. We have finally the, the individuality, which was a very liberal approach. Individualism and universalism were liberal approaches to, to understanding how he works. We believe that we have a shared common humanity that have uh, universal rights and that each individual should be able to fulfill his potential without being held back by any social factors. So... 
These, these were criticised by the postmodern in favour of a group identity of small local narratives. The first postmodernists and their ideas burnt themselves out after about 20 years. Because if you keep dismantling things um, over and over again, you, you end up with with nothing but a mess. There, there's nowhere that you can go from that. So at the end of the 80s and the beginning of the 90s, we saw a new wave of theorists from branches of theory called things like post-colonial theory, critical race theory, intersectional feminism. And they came and took these ideas of the postmodernists, the ones that I've, I've just discussed, and they've said, these are useful, but we can't just dismantle everything. We need to have some objective truth. And what they decided was objective true was the very systems of power and privilege to be acted as known. Everything else is infinitely malleable and a construct and can be addressed by changing the way we talk about things. So this we have called applied postmodernism because it became politically actionable. So within post-colonial theory, we saw the argument that the West had constructed the East in order to construct its understand itself as rational, scientific, and advanced and there's a lot of truth in this and, and suggest that well actually everybody can can use science can use reason they're universals the post-colonial theorists have tended to maintain division maintain that science and reason are white western male and that they have been privileged unfairly over other ways of knowing which belong to people who are not white and who are female and who have a marginalized identity of, of some kind of course this is really quite racist then we had queer theory which um took off in the 90s and, and it was also very postmodern in that it wanted to keep dismantling categories the point of if one is queer if you don't fit into this category of feminine woman attracted to men or masculine man attracted to women the idea that you are queer comes from outside this now queer is political statement it regards these categories of sexuality and gender as oppressive and constructive so if somebody describes themselves as queer rather than say as gay you can usually tell that they are regarding this as a political identity rather than straightforwardly as sexuality queer race theory arose to push back at liberalism, the idea that we should be colorblind. It's not a claim that we are, but a claim that we should not evaluate people by the color of their skin. This um, has been the liberal approach to trying to remove barriers and unnecessary social significance attached to racial identity. This wasn't uh, well received in critical race theory. That wanted to focus much more on putting emphasis on uh, race and on identity politics, increasing the extent to which we see race and racism in society. Intersectional feminism came largely from critical race theory, but it's had the effect of making feminism become much less about women. Women as a class are, are just a single category. In intersectionality, we're looking at ways in which different aspects of identity all sort of stack up together. Together. So we're primarily interested in um, black women or trans women or people who have a collection of identities, a supposedly a more sophisticated approach that can learn a number of things at once. But in practice, it, it becomes both messy and highly simplistic. Then relative newcomers are in disability studies. Now, these strangely take a lot of their focus from queer theory. And they essentially claim that we as a society have been led to believe that having all of our body parts work properly and having being a healthy weight and able to move around easily is um, actually only socially constructed as a good thing. The idea that, uh, that that it's better to be healthy and slim is an oppressive narrative and it must not be suggested. Um, it's, it's oppressive to suggest that that either of these problems sort of need treatment. So th this is a very strange um, approach. We are apparently living in a fat phobic and ableist society that has arbitrarily decided that disability and obesity are, are less than desirable. So if you can try and imagine this worldview where 
you are born into a society in which all these streams and currents of power are running. White supremacy, um, patriarchy, heteronormativity, the expectation to be heterosexual, cisnormativity, the expectation to identify as the, the sex related to your reproductive system, ableism, fat phobia. You are born into these. You internalize them. You speak, they run through you and you speak uncritically into them. We need, apparently, critical theorists to enable us to see these systems and dismantle them. So this has been growing and solidifying since about 1990, when this actionable form of postmodernism began. A scholarship built up a tremendous amount, a body of scholarship is built up on top of these ideas, developing them further and further. They've gained significant amount of legitimacy from, from having been published repeatedly and cited and having so much in they have the impression of legitimate scholarship we don't really think they are while there is good scholarship going on out there in, in these realms the ones that draw on postmodern ideas are, are really not remotely sound as they've got more um uh, more sort of sure of themselves, the language is clearer. We can read someone like Robin DiAngelo much more easily than we could read Judith Butler or um, Homi Baba. And th this is because of the confidence. This is good we can get ideas now and we can change them. But unfortunately, also makes them much easier to spread. And this is a problem when we're looking at the number of young people, particularly, who want to make a better place, who who are really taking on a lot of the, these very simplistic ideas about white supremacy and and patriarchy and and try and trying to just lay this simple framework over society. We've also seen in the last couple of years there's been narrowing of intersectional focus. Whereas we used to have all of these different categories at once, we've seen that recently women have become less of a focus for the critical justice. We've seen the the right women in tears and the Karen meme because insufficient of women are being properly intersected. This has also affected gay men who are not invariably fans of queer theory and may even be um, conservative or have quite different ideas. Bians as well are often suspected of, of being trans-exclusionary radical feminists and so we don't see a lot of focus on them. We've been increasingly hearing that Jews and East Asian people are white adjacent. So what we're seeing coming out now of this critical social justice approach is really two main, um, main focuses, and these are trans activism and critical race theory. So those are the two that you are really most likely to come across in your, your daily life. So trans activism draws on queer theory and intersectional feminism. Consequently, it's quite contradictory because it attempts to blend a political activism which wants to break down identity categories with a political activism that works on identity politics. So it can be quite hard to sort of get your head around what is going on with trans activism. From the queer theory, we get science denial. It claims that sex is a spectrum, even though there's much evidence that we are, in fact, bimodal, sexually reproducing species. Reproductive systems tell us nothing about whether someone is a man or a woman. This is then understood to be a matter of gender, which is decided by the individual. The individual's sense of their own sex as male or female is authoritative. Therefore, if somebody with a penis says she feels like a woman, her penis becomes a female penis. Furthermore, if your attraction to someone depends upon them having a certain set of genitals rather than a gender identity, you are being transphobic. So this is very different to the scientific position, which is beginning to explain why some people might be trans. And the liberal position, which holds that people should be able to identify and live as they see fit, provided it doesn't harm anybody else. From the intersectional feminism, we get this focus on trans women as an identity group with intersecting variables of marginalized identity. Both trans and women, this creates an imperative to prioritize trans women over biological women, or known as cis women, who do not have an intersectional identity. So this causes problems, particularly with the gender critical feminists who believe that sex is real, but gender is a construct. So... In, in this belief, if you are believing, um, as 
so many do that but women is a biological category trans identity simply can't exist and this is a long-standing um, belief of radical feminism whether you agree with it or not this is something that this is a position that they should be allowed to hold so but gender critical feminists are particularly under fire at the moment uh, accused of being turfs trans exclusionary radical feminists they are being deplatformed they are being intimidated and threatened on a regular basis if you haven't already seen the website turf is a slur i recommend having a look at it because this is quite eye opening in the amount of abuse these particular kind of feminists exist um sort of experience so we don't have to actually agree with them they can be extremely disparaging about men but we do need to support their right to be able to speak and furthermore we really do actually have an issue that needs to be discussed right now we have a case with trans people who are marginalized and experience a great deal of hostility how to accept and include them in society without taking away uh vital rights for women, particularly where women are vulnerable, prisons and shelters and women's sports in which women could really just be um, entirely pushed out um, if trans women are accepted uncritically as women in every situation. And then critical race theory is, is the big one at the moment that's having the most impact on um, the US. The whole sort of trans and gender critical feminist debate is particularly raging here in the UK. But in the US, critical race theory is um, quite clearly on everybody's lips and everybody's minds at the moment. So what is that? How are we to understand it? Is it just racial sensitivity? Is it recognizing black people as fuel human beings? This is, this is what some of its defenders have been saying. Or a continuation of the civil rights movement. Any attempt at all to address racism? No, th this is not what critical race theory is. We are being presented with a false dichotomy here. We are told we can either get on, on board with critical race theory or oppose racial equality. We can either be anti-racist in a very specific way or we're just racist. It is essential to recognize that critical race theory is just one approach to opposing racism. And it is in opposition to the one that characterized the civil rights movements. So Angela Davis, one of the most radical um, critical race scholars, says, unlike traditional civil rights discourse, which stresses incrementalism and step by step progress, critical race theory questions the very foundations of the order, including equality theory, legal reasoning, enlightenment rationalism and neutral principles of constitutional law. So this is a really radical position, which is criticizing the foundations of secular liberal democracy. You can disagree with that without being racist, that, that should be clear. Davis, of course, was a Marxist. She spoke at least as much about us as she did about race. And we can see some elements of Marxism in radical movements like Black Lives Matter. However, in wider society and organizations and training programs, we're much more likely to see and be expected to comply with the work of two main figures. And those are Ibram X. Kendi and Robin D'Angelo. And they both present us with false dichotomies. For Ibram Kendi, one can either be racist or anti-racist. To be anti-racist, one must accept that all disparities are the result of racist policies in society and devote oneself evening them up by whatever means necessary. To believe or do anything else is racist. So Kendi does not claim that all white people are racist, but he makes racism or anti-racism a matter of agreeing or disagreeing with his simplistic view of society. Robin D'Angelo, on the other hand, and she's probably the one you're more likely to encounter in, in diverse training, um, is she presents us with a different kind of false dichotomy. For her, all white people are racist and their only choice is whether to be racist and admit which enables dismantling it be racist and deny it which is bad and selfish and perpetuates the problem of racism for her there is an invisible force called white that operates to press people of color in hidden ways where people do anything for her the question is not did racism take place but how did racism manifest in this situation so we are stuck in this this situation where you, you simply cannot um, disagree with this. Neither of these approaches can be disagreed with legitimately, according to their founders. 
For Kenny, any attempt to suggest that reality might be more complicated than he tests is to blame black people for having worse life outcomes and is therefore racist. For D'Angelo to disagree with her claim that all white people are racist, or even to stay quiet, to go away, to do anything apart from remain there and agree with her, um, is diagnosed by her as white fragility. White fragility being the name of her book, which is currently being recommended in schools, universities and to employers all over the country at this moment. So these kind of traps make offering alternative principled and based ways to address them very difficult. However, we believe it can be done. I am having some luck at the moment with, with trying to help people push back at this kind of um, the imposition of these kind of ideas at their university, their children, their place of work. But but it is difficult. Jim is going to speak a bit more about what we can can do to to oppose this. OK, thanks, Helen. Um, so I, I I found myself lately when I try to talk to audiences feeling like I have to start with some kind of a confession, which is that I find it nearly impossible to get people to understand what we're talking about. And that I think that that might be because we're not framing it in ways that, that they understand because there's such a huge gap between um, understanding this kind of upside down topsy-turvy world of theory and understanding uh, the, the world that we all kind of have accepted, which is broadly speaking, a liberal conception, a philosophically liberal conception of, of the world that we haven't actually spent a lot of time defending or thinking about, uh, especially since the fall of the uh, Soviet Union and the Berlin Wall. So in maybe 30 years, we haven't put much thought into rigorously and robustly standing up for liberal principles against some kind of encroachment against it. And that's what this is. So I wanna try to take what Helen said and frame it so that you can understand what you might be able to do in a practical sense, if that's possible. And so if you want to push back, if you want to do something about this ideology where you encounter it in life, you're going to have to understand a few things first. And on, on some level, the main thing you have to understand, if I simple, simplify it down to one point, which is not going to be all you have to understand, is that the critical social justice ideology is actually a highly evolved set of tools that have been selected because they're extremely good at eroding their opponents authority, their sense of authority and confidence in themselves to speak and be believed. And they are extremely good at that. Deconstruction takes, for example, as Helen spoke about deconstruction and postmodernism, takes the authority out of the meaning of words themselves. So even the people who are speaking them don't necessarily have any authority in what they've said, because uh, that, that, that meaning that they're trying to convey can't be found properly in the words themselves that they've used. And so you have this undermining of authority of everything that opposes the critical social justice or woke ideology as kind of its uh, primary modus operandi. And I want to linger for one second on that idea of opponents. A lot of times we don't like embattled language, uh, but it sees us as its opponents, liberals in general, people who believe in liberal values like individualism, objective truth, science, reason, rationality, civility, rule of law, uh, reliability, uh, loyalty, productivity, punctuality. These are all different traits that it opposes and the people who support those, it sees as its opponents. So I, I, as a first step, I actually want to encourage people to start accepting the branding that they're offering us and to start opposing it. If we're going to be its opponents, we should do so honestly. So we need to understand how it undermines authority. And it does so by kind of two main avenues, which if Helen made pretty clear, the various, the critical theory aspect and the postmodern epistemological aspect make that very clear. One of those is that it makes you, the people that, it, that it's, it's targeting, it tries to make those people feel like they're a bad person. And so how does it do that? It might accuse you of having bad intentions critical theories in general are almost, you could almost boil them down just to say that it's reading cynical and negative intentions into 
people's actions. So Helen and I have very often now given the example that if we had a shop and uh, you have to help each customer individually, you're the only person working and you for some reason have a two customers, one white and one black enter uh, back to back and you have to pick who to answer or to, who to help first, that under a critical race theory analysis, both of those choices would be racist. So if you were to help the white person first, you obviously think white people are first class citizens and black people should be made to have to wait, which is a racist assumption. On the other hand, if you were to help the black person first, that would be because one of two things that jump to mind. One is that uh, you don't trust black people to be left unattended in your store and you want to get them out as quickly as possible, which is racist, or that you actually did want to help the white person first and performatively single signaled your allyship by choosing to help the person you didn't want to help the black person. Uh, and, in, and in both cases, that would be interpreted by critical race theory as racist. So in all regards, you're going to be branded as a racist no matter what you do. And the way that it accomplished that, it will say we're going to look at impact, not intent. But what it's actually doing is reading malevolent intent into your action and then claiming that that had an impact upon the person. And so the impact is a subjective assessment of your bad uh, motivations. So it undermines your authority to feel like a good person by by ascribing bad intentions to you that you probably don't have. But of course, because your intentions live in your head, you couldn't possibly prove what your intentions were. And it wouldn't matter anyway, because then they would accuse you of having false consciousness, even if you could convince them. Uh, internalized dominance, for example, uh, that you believe that, it, that you're right and justified to do as you do. It also tends to undermine authority in terms of kind of your moral authority by suggesting that people are have, have moral complicity in the, the evils of systemic oppression. So when Helen spoke about how Robin D'Angelo frames the world in terms of whiteness, that's a suggestion that all white people have this form of property, as Cheryl Harris put it, that uh, goes along with having white skin and being a person of some white ethnicity uh, and every such person, according to Barbara Applebaum, is morally complicit in the, the, the system of racism and white supremacy that they theorize into existence uh, as located in whiteness. And so automatically you're on your back foot. You're automatically put on your heels that you have to check your privilege that because you have this color of skin or these particular ethnicities, you're the inheritor of cultural property social property that gives you access to resources and opportunities you wouldn't have otherwise. And so it puts you on, on your heels, making you feel like you're a bad person for things that you probably had nothing to do with. Uh, you certainly had nothing to do with enslaving anybody, for example, and they will often appeal to the legacy of slavery as though, um, if you will, the sins of the father transfer through group identity. And this is because, as Helen put it, they have denied the individual, they've denied universal humanity in favor of group identity. And so each person operates as, a, as an avatar of their group or as a representative or an ambassador of their group. And so they are also, uh, they also have to represent all of the evil that that group has ever done and uh, make up for it to the groups that have been oppressed. This is why I often say, when we talk about social justice, especially as we put it in cynical theories with the capital S and capital J, or what we call now more often critical social justice to make it more clear, that it's not interested in justice for uh, people whatsoever. It is in fact interested in justice for the socially constructed groups that it says are the problem in the first place. Uh, so it, it, you though, by benefiting from whatever systems of power allegedly benefit you are complicit in evil and these moral evils. And so it undercuts your authority that way. Uh, Privilege is another aspect of that, of course. And with privilege comes the moral failure of uh, willful ignorance. And it's very focused on willful ignorance. It's so focused on willful ignorance that it has a variety of different uh, species of willful ignorance as active ignorance and pernicious ignorance and a very specific white ignorance that are all forms of willful ignorance that have other uh, consequences. So the, the easiest way to understand willful ignorance is that you don't know and you don't want to know. That appears frequently in the, the critical social justice literature as the summary of what it is. And so they, the belief is kind of in great parallel to Calvinist theology 
that privilege works very much like depravity. It is uh, depravity is the theological concept that says that human beings are corrupted by sin and therefore are made to want to sin. They want they want to stay in their state of sin and they don't want to have to do the hard work of repentance and seeking say justification and all of the things that they talk about. Privilege works the same way. So people who have privilege are, according to these theories, um, led to a state of what they sometimes call comfort or equilibrium, white comfort, white equilibrium or two that are named in which they want to keep that status for themselves, even if it's all unconscious. That's where this internalized dominance concept comes in again, a type of false consciousness that Helen mentioned. So privilege wants to keep itself privileged. So you have concepts that very explicitly name this dynamic. For example, uh, Alison Bailey put forth the idea of privilege preserving epistemic pushback, which says that whenever somebody argues back or pushes back the real reason, again, reading their intentions in a cynical way, is so that they might preserve their privilege. But they think that this is an inherent property of privilege, is that privilege blinds people to the nature of privilege and leads them to want to keep their privilege, even if it's an unconscious or an implicit bias to do so. So that puts you, again, in a position where you lack authority, because if you speak from a position that they can brand as privileged or adjacent to privilege in some way, you're now all of a sudden caught up in a conspiracy theory on your own behalf, or you're in fact, even worse, cynically self-interested, which is where you'll see, uh, say, a black person speaking up against critical race theory and be accused of uh, having internalized racism or being a race traitor. Um, so by a number of means, it will try to convince you that you are a bad person. And what the purpose of that is, is to undercut your sense of authority uh, in yourself so that the words that you speak and the values that you hold and the ideas that you share don't carry weight. They're not believable. You're unsure of yourself. Hearers are unsure of, of you. They don't know uh, that you are coming from a place of being genuine. They don't know if you're you're coming from a place of uh, enough confidence, in a sense, internally to be to be believable, to be credible. The second big way that it undercuts your authority, and I don't have to linger quite as long on this, is by convincing the people that it that it goes after that they're stupid and this is why it's very very effective i think in academia more so than anywhere else uh, no academic that i've ever met and i've met a handful i'd say uh, likes to be the person who doesn't know what people are talking about and so when you have constantly changing definitions of racism constantly shifting terminology this very dense turgid ugly terminology with many syllables and often hyphens and, and it's very technical language and you have this kind of constantly shifting landscape oh well we're not talking about racial sensitivity today we're talking about cultural uh, responsiveness and you have this kind of shifting landscape uh, and we can't understand ideas like racism without understanding them in a systemic sense so we can't understand an idea of diversity unless we're willing to first understand what diversity means in the context of systemic power and it, it, this whole elaborate, as Helen said, falsely sophisticated construct is designed to undermine epistemic authority, to make it feel like you, to make you feel like you're stupid when you encounter them. The kind of meme, simple version of this would be somebody to come up and say something about someone being racist or a situation being racist or an institution being racist. And then somebody says, show me where the racism is. And then they say, that just proves you don't even understand racism. You, you're so dumb. You don't even understand racism the way that it really manifests in the world, which is you don't have a systemic understanding of racism, which means you don't understand racism in the way that these uh, critical theories understand racism. So it leads you to, to, to look stupid that you don't understand the ideas or what they properly describe. It leads you to feel unsophisticated and in the presence of sophisticates who then obviously get to speak for you. If you put this in kind of an administrative sense, you have somebody say in the administration of a university, even more prominently in a corporate environment where you have a CEO whose business is doing business of whatever type it is, or an organization whose business is to serve whatever charity they serve or any other context. These people don't have time to learn all this stuff all the time. They don't know what's going on. And what they have is somebody who sounds extraordinarily clear and sophisticated, coming up with very uh, kind of superficial challenges in the other direction 
that are then very quickly discredited on, on grounds that sound academic, but are actually, I hope, as we showed with our grievance studies, if they're kind of falsely academic, they're sophistry, not, not knowledge. Uh, but nevertheless, it's convincing to people in positions of, say, policy or hiring or, or whatever that, oh, well, these are the real experts. I'm going to stay in my lane and we're going to defer to the people who look like they know more. Uh, another way that it does a, a big step of making you feel uh, stupid is through um, the, the very construct of false consciousness. Uh, it's not even that you, you, I don't have to linger on this, but it's not even that you, you don't know, you're not even aware that you don't know. And you've basically been brainwashed, which causes people to turn around and do a lot of introspection. Maybe there's something I missed. Maybe I have been more racist than I ever thought. Maybe I actually do things that support a system. Maybe I don't buy enough black brands or something like this, as if a brand can be given a race. And so these concepts work to undermine your authority. Uh, what Helen described near the end of when she was speaking just now with with uh, Robin D'Angelo and Ibram Kendi offering you, uh, what, do you what, what do we call them? false dichotomies, that's another way that they actually undermine your ability to feel authority. You're put in this position that's sometimes called a decision dilemma, where you have to pick between kind of two things, which is either speaking into the thing that they are offering or uh, outing yourself as somehow complicit in some system of evil and it, it's a false choice so they they often are able to get people to confess to something that leads them to undermine their own authority in that way so these choices are of course false and helen was was fairly clear you know with with kendi he gives you the false choice of being either racist or anti-racist he says there's no such thing as not racist well being not racist is a position of authority it's a position that you can stand and say, no, I know I'm not racist. I know that wasn't my motivation and I'm not going to accept that. But by saying that no such thing exists, you have no possibility of doing that. Uh, and so you're caught in this situation where, where you lack moral authority. Uh, and this is, of course, a false choice. Uh, Robin D'Angelo, on the other hand, sets up a, a structure that's a nearly perfect what they call Kafka trap. And it's named after uh, Franz Kafka's novel, The Trial in which the protagonist, Joseph K, is put through a kangaroo court. And in particular, the, the thing that happens to him is every time he's accused and he denies his guilt or complicity or uh, involvement in, in what he's accused of, they take his denial as proof of his guilt. They say, oh, that's somebody who is guilty would say. You can think of kind of the quintessential Kafka trap is when somebody says, I'm not lying. And you get that kind of funny feeling. You say, well, that's what a liar would say. That, that's a kind of quintessential uh, Kafka trap. And, and white fragility is maybe one of the most pernicious and powerful Kafka traps in the world because she gives you no way out. Uh, if you are presented with an accusation of, of white supremacy or complicity in white supremacy as they define it or racism, not only have they redefined these terms so that they can say very morally charged words like racism and white supremacy and accuse you of complicity in those without necessarily your knowledge of understanding that they mean something very much different than what normal people would react rightly to as such an accusation. Somebody recently told me, by the way, that he treats being accused of being a rapist on the same or racist on the same level as being accused of being a rapist or a child rapist or something like that. It's a heinous thing to accuse somebody of. And Robin D'Angelo devotes a chapter in White Fragility or very nearly a chapter of White Fragility explaining take a breath. She even says, breathe. That's not what I mean. I mean something else. But in your everyday conversations, and when this comes up, it, that doesn't get communicated. That moral and visceral reaction that we have in uh, our now liberal equal societies against being something as heinous as a racist still flares up because the word has that attachment, that has that connotation that you don't get to get away from just because of some little, little um, academic trick of language. And so th this creates a nearly perfect Kafka trap because she says, once you're accused of any of those things, you either have to humbly, in her terms, accept the accusation and vow to do better on her terms, which she also details as a lifelong commitment to an ongoing process in which no one has ever done of including social activism on the behalf of what she calls anti-racism. Or you have options like uh, denying it going away from the situation, staying silent, uh, becoming emotional, 
arguing, all of those she say indicate that there's a lack of the necessary moral fiber to engage truthfully with the accusation. And therefore, you have what she calls white fragility, which is she defines kind of as a set of rhetorical strategies deployed because of a lack of racial stamina and a lack of racial humility to accept the charge of complicity, which she says is universal and constant and true for everyone. This means you can't deny white fragility. So this uh, false dichotomy she presents is a very particular and nasty type that offers you no options except to take the accusation on the chin in one way or another. Um, so she can, in a sense, or people empowered, if you want to use that word, by her ideas in her book, can then go out into society, accuse people of racism, accuse people of white fragility itself, and then they have no option but to either somehow accept the accusation or prove the accusation. And even denying the game itself uh, is treated as a form of white fragility. And therefore, you have no options whatsoever if you under, if you accept her basic premises about uh, society, which locks you into that false dilemma. And it's very difficult because of the nature of these concepts to escape that. So like I said, this is a set of very sophisticated tools. The theory itself presents itself as sophisticated, but is not. But the tools themselves are very sophisticated tools for undermining your authority, your ability to feel confident enough in yourself to speak, to speak truthfully, to speak honestly, to speak plainly, and to be heard as you're speaking and to be treated as being credible in how you've spoken. Uh, not to get nervous or uncomfortable and feel like you have to backpedal, waffle, qualify, give give away some of the ground. So it makes it impossible to stand in a set of alternative principles like liberalism. Uh, or if you happen to be a person of faith, you could stand in faith. But if you're if you're a, a secular liberal like Helen and I are, um, then you're going to want to stand in those liberal principles. And the goal is to use these tools to undermine your ability to do that. The whole postmodern language game situation, the whole cynical theories of critical theory situation are designed and have been cherry picked to get and cobbled together to undermine moral authority and anybody who tries to oppose it. Um, and so the question becomes, what can you do about that? Uh, now that you understand the problem, you've already taken the first step. You have to understand this in terms of it undermining your authority to speak and, and to recognize uh, that you are a credible person who can be heard on your terms. And what you have to do to answer it, I guess, is simple. You have to be able to claim authority. You have to be able to step back up and claim your own authority. And that doesn't come for free. The cynical theorists behind these ideas are not totally wrong. You can be granted authority by the prevailing milieu, the, the hegemony, if you will, or you have to earn it. And you don't get it for free if you try to earn it. It is an uphill battle. It is hard work. And that's what every kind of civil rights movement was actually all about, was finding that moral and intellectual authority for people whose society were saying weren't allowed to have any. So you've got to find a way to claim your authority. How can you do that? Well, the bitter pill is, as Helen said, you actually do have to learn some things. I, I recently gave a talk and a lady in the Q&A portion asked, which I don't know if it was a question even at all. She said, I don't want to have to learn more stuff. I don't want to have to read more books. I don't want to have to become smarter. I just know these people are wrong and I want to be able to assert that. So what she, you can see now, the context here is that she's speaking from a place where she knows her, she should have the authority to be, to speak and be considered credible, but that's been taken away from her and she doesn't know how to get it. And then one avenue toward getting it is one that she doesn't want to undertake. She doesn't want to have to learn more stuff. And that's a problem because, I mean, in my head, while she was saying it, I literally had a picture of something like, you know, World War II or something. And uh, you know, sir, the Germans have aircraft. What are we going to do? And it's like, I don't want to learn about airplanes. I don't want to build an anti-aircraft gun. Let's just fight them. And it, it doesn't work. The tools of this, if you want to call it an ideological war or culture war, are very academic terms. And they are being fought over very clear principles, uh, the enlightenment principles of rationality, science, reason, liberalism, the individual, uh, rule of law. They are being fought on that battlefield. And if you don't want to learn some of this stuff, it's like saying that you don't want to, to equip yourself 
to do that, that's fine. There are other things you can do. If you don't want to learn any of the stuff, if you don't want to become informed about it, make yourself as productive as possible. Get out in the world and try to do something that's separate from that. At least try to keep yourself sane. Support people who are, if you can, lean into that support. Ask them questions. If they show up as woke, don't offer them support. If they show up as, uh, you know, somewhere in the middle and a bit uh, unsure, support them in the sense of a support group, but don't lean too hard into it. These people, though, however, if you're concerned about this problem who are standing up, I can guarantee you they're not having the best time. Support them more vigorously. Try to help them stay solid. Uh, those are things you can do if you don't want to learn anything. But the bitter pill is that if you want to fight, if you want to push back, you have to learn something. You have to learn enough. You don't have to do like, as Helen said, it's a full-time job for she and I to keep up with what's going on. You don't have to learn that much, but you do have to learn some of the basics and you do have to learn some of the basics of the civics that it's trying to undermine so that you can articulate those principles and answer. Um, so you have to learn how it speaks. You have to learn how it thinks. You have to learn how it manipulates so that you can actually spot those things when they appear. For example, President Trump's uh, executive order against critical race theory does absolutely nothing if the people who are empowered to do it can't spot critical race theory when it uses different words. If they if they are caught up on just simple keywords, are these words here? Are they not? OK, that's the test. You actually have to have people who understand critical race theory and can spot it in action. So. Those people have to be educated in this to a degree of some sophistication or his executive order will do nothing. And that even if it did everything that it's supposed to live up to. And this, by the way, that applies. It's not just Pre President Trump. It's anybody who wants to resist this. Anybody who wants to resist this issue has to be able to do that. They have to be able to spot the problem. They have to be able to, to say, no, OK, I see where you're doing what you're doing here. I see how you're focusing on one of maybe it's the postmodern principles or themes. Maybe it's one of the critical theory approaches to um, problematizing uh, cynically reading motives. You have to be able to spot it in real time for what it does rather than just kind of uh, searching out keywords and, and trying to uh, avoid those. You also have to know the replies. You have to know how these manipulations, for example, you also know how to have to how to figure out how to deal with those when they when they come along. You have to be able to articulate other principles. Um, in particular, you know, Helen mentioned the false dichotomy. There's a very particular thing that happens a great deal that you need to learn to be able to spot, which is strategic equivocation. Um, the kind of colloquial name for that is often given as Mott and Bailey as an argumentative strategy where you have a very defensible version of your position that everybody agrees with, like all lowercase black lives matter. And then that there's a very radical proposition that's wrapped up in the same packaging that when you're not getting too much scrutiny or criticism, that's what you're actually working on or doing. Like the capital black lives matter foundation, which is an organization with very specific, or it's, it's, it's kind of a conglomerate or a syndicate of organizations with very specific ideology, goals, uh, and vision that, that isn't necessarily fully representative of the, the, the uh, defensible three-word phrase that's an obvious truth. You have to be able to spot these kinds of things and work with these, uh, these strategic equivocations between something reasonable and something unreasonable. Something reasonable is maybe the police do need reform and we should have a conversation about that and use the mechanisms of liberal society to do it. It's something unreasonable is defund the police. And when they're using the same phrase to mean both, you have the ability to strategically equivocate between those. So you have to be able to see through that. There is a way to deal with strategic equivocation that with a little bit of practice, you can actually get quite good at. But again, you have to start from learning some of the material. The way you deal with a strategic equivocation using the Martin Bailey metaphor, as I've laid it out in the past, is that you have to steal their Mott and bomb their Bailey. So the Mott is the defensible idea. So you have to take that defensible idea, see that kernel of truth in the thing that they are pushing and articulate it in consistent liberal principles better than they do. They do see truths about the world. They then go crazy with those. You then also have to be able to articulate the Bailey, which is the more radical proposition that they're trying to advance. And you have to be able to explain in detail why that's not what we want to be doing, the why that's not a good idea, why that doesn't rest in, say, consistent liberal principles, why that might cause harms. There's different ways to do it. So you have to be able to identify that kernel of truth, understand it in terms of the consistent principles, articulate those principles as well as or better 
ideally better than the cynical theorists could do so. And then you also have to be able to make sure that they can't convince the audience that, that they're speaking to in the room that all they want to do is just the mot. You have to be able to identify their broader, more radical concept of the world and call it out that uh, in clear terms and, and criticize it in clear terms that people can understand. It. None of this is easy. And so people who want to go all the way into this are charged with the unfortunate position of having to speak truth, constantly speak truth, because they will manipulate you if you get it wrong uh, to a great deal. Don't speak outside of your level of understanding. Your authority lies in what you actually know. We actually do have the epistemic high ground when we believe in reason, rationality, and science, uh, and objective standards in the world. We actually have the ethical high ground or the moral high ground when we believe in individualism and universal humanity the rule of law, fairness, uh, in, in, in the most gen uh, general and consistent sense. We have the high ground in all cases, but if you step outside and try to say things that are past what you understand, you, you sacrifice your own authority, which is the game that it's trying to get you to play. So you want to step away from that and speak only as far as you know, while you constantly do the work of trying to expand what you know, if you really want to try to take this on. Know your limits, try to expand your limits, try to learn more about this. But I think most importantly, you know, pick which of those sides you want to, if you need to dedicate effort into it? Uh, do you want to understand the theory and be able to articulate that and call it out? Or do you want to be able to articulate consistent liberal principles uh, and stand up for those in their place and, and claim the, the mantle of, of epistemic and moral authority to say, uh, no, I'm, I'm right here. You know, the, the, the evidence is on our side. The evidence backs this up. This is a consistent principle. This is a fair principle. This isn't a uh, subjective principle that favors certain political ideologies or people over others, especially based on categories like uh, identity, race, sex, gender, sexuality, ability, status, fat status, and so on. So you want to be able to do that. That's an absolutely necessary component of pushing back is to speak within what you know, try to expand the range of what you know and focus on the aspects that you really want to understand liberal principles again, learn to defend liberal principles again, but also try to learn and understand the deviations of theory and how uh, from those principles and or from consistency in those principles. It often argues for the principles, but without the consistency, uh, favoring one special interest group and in identity politics over over others. So look for that, and you can you can actually push back fairly effectively. Um, I'm, tight on time for, for the message that I wanted to deliver and it kind of worked out as it, as it winds down. One last thing I want to say is that you really have to, to accept a hard fact here, which is that until you understand that they view everything in the world through their lens of power dynamics and translate everything that is, is happening, every social interaction, every social phenomenon through the lens of power dynamics as they've theorized them, you can't understand anything they do. You don't understand what they say. When they say racism, you don't understand it. When they come to apply diversity at your office or your school, you don't understand it. When they say we need an inclusive environment, you don't understand it until you understand it in terms of power dynamics. When they say we need any of these things that they talk about, anti-racism, cultural responsiveness, social emotional learning, they've taken into all of these dimensions and added in the power dynamics. And until you understand it that way, you don't understand anything they do. And on the other hand, until you uh, understand how to reply from a place, and I think it's the most important thing, of consistent principles, if it applies to one group, it applies to the other groups. Until you learn to reply from consistent principles, you don't have a reply. There is, you are not going to be able to push back. Uh, and until you can understand why this is, is key, so you have to think about it. You have to go back and think about this. Until you can understand why these two elements are key, you don't and will not have the authority, whether it's epistemic or moral authority, to be comfortable and assertive and credible in your pushbacks. And so you will continue to be dismissed or feel uncomfortable giving them and, and otherwise not succeed. So to push back requires understanding enough to seize back the mantle of epistemic and uh, moral authority that comes with having consistent liberal ethics and a reliance on the values of human 
uh, rationality, objectivities, falsification in science, defeasibility, and uh, epistemic adequacy, these tools of, of epistemology that we've developed over the past 500 years to a great effect, great value, and great benefit for people. And that's where real progress lies. So I encourage you to want to do that. Okay. And, um, that, that was really excellent. And um, a lot of information there to unpack. So I just wanted to start with um, kind of one question that I have, because I've been seeing it very frequently, is kind of, um, and I guess James is more on your end, the kind of difference between, you know, racial sensitivity training and critical race theory training. Um, Chris Wallace at the presidential debate kind of conflated the two. Um, I've seen, you know, friends share on Facebook an NPR article that conflates Trump's executive order. Um, you know, how do you talk to, whether it's people in your workplace, friends, family, and, uh, and try to explain, you know, there's maybe a difference from what they would consider, you know, sensitivity uh, with kind of what's being um, discussed and I guess advocated for in, in, in these trainings. Sure. Yeah, I actually question most of the premise. I don't think that critical race theory is racial sensitivity training at all. And uh, I actually even question the need for much racial sensitivity training because of critical race theory and how much it's mainstreamed into society. And I'm not trying to be a reactionary or a fool here. Uh, I want to articulate, though, that, and I know this sounds kind of meme or, you know, some sounds like a cliche or whatever, but the truth is that critical race theory does not teach racial sensitivity. It teaches racial hypersensitivity. It teaches people from its first core assumption that racism is present in all phenomena, social phenomena and interactions. It is the ordinary state of affairs in society. And it is up to the critical race theorists to be able to see it, find it, point it out and make it an issue. So critical race theories march through society and its step into the institutions is actually hypersensitized us to race. It's, it's a very interesting lie that has taken me a very long time to be able to admit that we all are living right now, that we say, oh, well, of course we need more racial sensitivity. And we think, oh, I've made some comments that have made people feel uncomfortable in the past. And certainly I didn't mean to, and it'd be nice if we were more sensitive to the different cultural backgrounds. But the fact of the matter is, while there is some truth to that statement, and it is always good to, to learn, like, for example, after George Floyd died, I spoke with uh, some, some friends of mine who are black, and they, of course, had the reaction very much like Dave Chappelle did, where, you know, he had a very strong emotional reaction to this. Um, whatever the facts of the case may be, the strong emotional reaction came up. And what uh, my friends told me, and so what they, what they said was, these stories, whatever actually happened here, these are the stories our fathers told us. These are the stories our grandfathers told us. And so there is a, there is a reason to understand that there would be a reaction of that type and then sensitivity around that. That's a valuable project. OK, so I'm not dismissing the idea of racial sensitivity. On the other hand, we live this weird lie because it's very clear to almost everybody that we are too racially sensitive. We are uncomfortable often now around other races because we don't know if they're going to cause some kind of a problem or if somebody's going to. And this, I didn't I don't mean this. White people are uncomfortable. No, everybody is. Everybody is. Black people. I, I've spoken with some this weekend where I am now are uncomfortable to be around white people because they don't know if one of them's going to go into some white knight kind of white savior mode pulling out the critical race theory. I've heard, I don't know how many hundreds of, of people of color have come up to me and asked me or emailed me and asked me, many of them in person in the past maybe two months, how do I get my white friends to stop apologizing to me? It's driving me crazy. How do I get them to stop? And so this is almost, we've been racially hypersensitized. And so, I, you can't, you don't want to conflate the idea that, okay, it's very important to realize that there are within living memory, within alive now, people who experienced segregation, they experienced tremendous amounts of racism that were genuinely horrific. There are genuine issues around some of these concepts, you know, like even the idea like microaggression has a kernel of, of truth around it, that there are these kind of annoying things you have to hear all the time. Um, I, for example, spent the weekend at a Christian conference and I'm an atheist and I heard a lot of annoying things over and over and over again as a result of that. Uh, and 
there's there are truths around these things and yet it's possible to say that maybe putting race into every single saying that race is relevant to every single interaction race is relevant to every single phenomenon is not a route to making the problem better but one to make it worse and so i would like people to understand that for whatever value a genuine racial sensitivity training would have critical race theory is not that it's the opposite um I've, I'm trying to stay brief, but some of the horror, the stories I have heard from people about these sense, so-called sensitivity trainings are horrific. You take a, a an Indian woman sent me a, a note and said that she got put down in the middle of a room, kind of an amphitheater style classroom where, you know, you got the tiered seating. And so she's down in the middle of this tribunal kind of environment, it feels like, surrounded by her white colleagues and uh, being told by the, the request of the um, facilitator for every single person in that room to come in and explain to her how they've been racist. And so now she's got bad, rela uncomfortable relationships with all of these people in her office that weren't there before. And she said it was humiliating. It was uncomfortable. And then the next step was that they were then asked to interrogate their feelings of defensiveness and to drive even further into it. And who then everybody had to speak of, well, I felt defensive about this and I felt defensive. This is not racial sensitivity training. This is, this is something like a communist struggle session. This is uh, a very different thing. And at the very most generous explanation of it, it is racial hypersensitivity training. You look at the, the story of where microaggressions, since I mentioned them, arose with, with Daryl Wing Su. This is a Asian uh, on an aircraft who was asked along with, I think, a black person to move to other seats because they had to redistribute the weight on the aircraft. And so seats numbers, you know, 15B and 15C need to move to a different part of the plane to balance the weight. And it happened to be this Asian person who's a critical race theorist and this uh, black person. And Daryl Wing Su perceived that there must have been racism in this or that it was racist regardless, confronted the flight attendant and said, I, that was a racist thing. And then the flight attendant replied, no, it's just which seats had to move. I'm sorry. Uh, it's just what happens. And it's just which ones it's where the, where the weight actually is. And, but it doesn't matter what the reality was. It was perceived since only people of color had to move and had to move further back in the plane as bringing up memories of the back of the bus stories from segregation and so on. And so this is nonsense. This is hypersensitizing people to everyday routine interactions and words that's not making anything better, but is making lots of things worse. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. And so there's also, of, I think there's an element. Of... Go ahead, Helen. <laughs> We had a, a, a break. Yeah. As I said, I think often there's there's a kind of Orientalism um, that goes on here because where the the idea of Orientalism in the first place was that um, we regard people as. Of, the West is trying to construct itself a certain way. White um, Western people need to see themselves in a certain way, and they're using um, white people and non-Western people as a foil in order to do that. And I think there's there's also a, a, a version of that in in this in the most of um, uh, woke manifestations of this because we we know for example that the most progressive um, are predominantly white and if they've got this kind of theory that's going on there's a tendency to use it on everybody else and to actually expect people all races to play their part in it and if they happen to have that um, same belief so um, I just saw some statistics uh, recently which said as many African Americans believe that racial um uh, race relations will be improved by emphasizing qualities um, rather than the difference that you're trying you're there's a uh, there's a, a part of pushing this onto people where you have to act in this role so that I can be this self-aware um, white person dismantling my own whiteness that and I think people really could do if you are a conservative, for example, I see a question here from from Liam who wants to sort of let uh, how to um, 
how to to have a position which fall in this dichotomy of black lives matter or all lives matter if we can have some black conservatives read some um, liberals, some centrists, some liberals, some leftists, and I get an idea of the, the sheer range of views on racial issues as expressed by intellectuals who are experiencing them and, and don't allow the end of um, it, it to continue where we are only supposed to listen to the black people who agree with critical race theory. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so I think another question to kind of uh, get on the um, the language point, Helen, and this comes from Evan, is so uh, Evan asks, uh, do D'Angelo and Kendi realize that what they've actually accomplished is people not caring about being accused of being racist anymore or kind of making the accusation of being racist since everything's racist then nothing's racist, I guess. I, I think this is a, a serious problem, and I, I've addressed it a lot. I can I just think it is a tool risible to take the approach that you know, in particular has taken, where racist isn't a bad thing, an immoral thing. It's a thing that everybody is. I think we we do a lot better if we maintain an understanding that racism is a, a, a set of stupid and unethical ideas that people should be ashamed of holding. Now, they're trying to yeah, do the, the opposite. Of, and, and it is a concern because now if we're in a situation where we hear somebody described as racist, I think a lot of people are trying to interpret that as not agreeing 100% with critical race ideas rather than having racial prejudice. So I, I don't think that they will take that in at all, but I should. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, James, um, one question here that, that I think is fairly important. Um, so in the academy, uh, and, and, and this question comes from David, what is the most important audience? Um, so is it, you know, students, administrators, faculty, colleagues, alumni, the general public? If you're, if you're in the academy... Um, kind of who should you be be talking to and, and, and which has the most influence, I guess. I don't have a lot of uh, encouraging thoughts about the academy right now. I feel like it is, of course, the most embattled location in our society. Um, in that sense, though, uh, of the list that's given, the, the two that jump out to me are, are students and alumni. Uh, students because they need to hear the counter arguments. That's the point of being a student as it is. Uh, they need to be engaged on this. They need to be having robust decisions. This is regardless of its truth or falsity, this is a profound cultural issue at the moment. There's a profound set of ideas that are everywhere uh, throughout society. And so having intelligent and clear engagement on these that's coming from a diverse set of perspectives. And I don't mean that in terms of critical theories of identity, but rather, you know, whether it's conservative, whether it's a faith, whether it's liberal, whether it's progressive, whether it's left liberal, whether it's all the way woke, uh, those different perspectives need to be able to be engaged intelligently in the students. That's sort of their charge. The sad part is it's normally the faculty's job to encourage and challenge the students. And so I got this email recently from a young woman who's in teacher education college, and she said that uh, it was very inspiring to me. She said that, you know, all of her classes are deeply steeped in critical pedagogy. They're all, they're all basically social justice or critical social justice classes. It's all this, it's, you know, all of their readings, all of their assignments, they're all kind of bogus. It's just to get her grades, she writes down the buzzwords and then she does on her weekends and evenings. And I guess everybody doesn't have those because she studies how to be a teacher for real on her own. And so, um, the faculty are too often not pushing that, whether it's out of uh, fear, whether it's out of true belief in the case of the ones who have taken it on, which is many, whether it's the case of sort of uh, curricular policy or the, the prevailing pedagogy at the school, uh, whether it's because modules have been, been added to the books, whether the curriculum has been changed. There's a wide variety of reasons. The administration is much more difficult because the administration tends to be where 
this ideology lodges itself. Um, it's primary, if you were to think of it, and I know, well, I would say it's unfair to call it a virus, except they call themselves a virus. So since they called themselves a virus, I think it's okay to call them a virus. We can cite that paper if we have to. It's called Women's Studies as a Virus, so you can look it up. That's the title um, by Brianne Foss and Michael Carger, 2016. Um, it, if this were a virus, you know, viruses attached to certain uh, proteins on the cells and then inject their their genetic material and then do the viral thing. One of the key, if you think of institutions uh, as the cell, they tend to attach on administrative bureaucracies and the rapid growth of administrative bureaucracies, especially with regard to this thing, uh, this ideology, especially in universities, has been longer and more more thoroughgoing than pretty much anywhere else. So the administration should be reached out to to the degree that it can be, but it's more or less cooked. If you want to engage your administration, you need to bait them into doing what happened to Princeton, I suppose, where Princeton admitted that they're systemically racist. And this whole confessional from the president and the Department of Education said, well, wow, that puts you in violation of the Civil Rights Act, uh, Title Seven or six, maybe. And therefore, we need to evaluate those billions of dollars we've given you over the years. And all of a sudden, the administration cares in a different way because their incentive structure just changed. Um, as far as reaching to the broader public, that's always, I think, necessary. We look at something like Trump's executive order and the fear I have around something like that, which I think was an effective thing. And I note that it does not ban, he said that he's gonna ban critical race theory in the federal government. And then his first OMB memo that went out from Roosevelt also said that they were going to ban specifically critical race theory and, and then uh, uh, white privilege as kind of watchwords. But the exact the actual executive order does not do that. It bans certain things that critical race theory does, not what it is. And if you read what those things are, many of the things that it lists would also ban white supremacy. <laughs> so it's it's it would also ban genuine patriarchy. Uh, so it's perfectly okay to do that. However, it's very limited um, in that it's a top-down solution that can only reach so far. It can't change the culture. And if the truth uh, that critical theorists, I think, rightly discovered is that politics live downstream from culture, we're certainly one election away from the executive order being overturned, but we're always at risk of the politics continuing to push in the direction of more critical theory unless we can change the culture that's currently accepting a lot of it. So the general public is very important in this regard. They will also put pressure on the uh, elected bodies to, you know, put pressure via funding. And there are ways that are bad to do that. Victor Orban's strict ban of gender theories was bad, in my opinion. Uh, it's Ministry of Truth stuff that has no place in a, in a in academic freedom environment. But on the other hand, banning certain types of practices that are actually demonstrably uh, uh, discriminatory and banning certain types of practices that are, are clearly not based in truth. Uh, in a sense that these, these trainings, like diversity trainings, there's very little evidence, for, especially in the manifestations that they're being used or unconscious bias trainings. There's no evidence that they work. In fact, there's almost no evidence about them at all because the studies just aren't being done. Well, that actually is defrauding the people who are, are buying them. So there are reasons to protect from that outside of some kind of heavy handed. No, we're not going to teach these things. And to, to address it at the level of the administration is also not to address it at the level of, of the um, classroom. Right. So if you actually read the executive order from Trump, for example, um, it says that you can teach critical race theory as long as you're teaching it in a kind of comparative uh, situation or this is as you can teach it as, as this is what it is. You can understand what it is. This is what it teaches. This is what it says. You can read the text, but you're not allowed to use the divisive concepts in a kind of a instructional or indoctrinatory manner. Uh, and that applies, especially at the administrative level where that should not be because it safeguards students from it. So it's very important to, to awaken the public to that. Faculty and students, I think very importantly, who are, nervous about this, concerned about this, or outright against it, need to start banding together. They need to start talking to one another, forming coalitions, mm -hmm. knowing who they are, forming groups that support one another, that are dedicated to the real projects of, that are of value, which are understanding the issues like I outlined when I was speaking in both regards, and then supporting one another and standing up, articulating, showing up to meetings, showing up to, to write things for the newspapers, showing up 
uh, to, to give that to talks and things and to give that perspective. And that's easier the more organized you get and the more support you feel like you have, the more friends you feel like you have. It's very hard when you think you're just one or two out there. So those people who are already sympathetic and if they can loop in the alumni, even better. I Maybe they can find some administrators, but I think that that's temporarily at least a lost cause. Yeah, so I mean, one, one question I have, and this is I think kind of on the um, I guess more legalistic front. So, so you see in California, there's a, a ballot issue campaign right now to get rid of their anti-discrimination law because it bans affirmative action uh, effectively. Um, and so, uh, you know, if you are kind of a student or faculty member uh, in the academy in this situation and your school has kind of a um, anti-discrimination policy, especially if you're at a public institution, is, is that something that you should be kind of looking at and investigating and seeing if um, that can be used in your favor? I mean, I think so. Uh, <laughs> from my perspective, I think that people should be looking for a few different avenues. One is uh, that one is that uh, is there an actual issue of discrimination? Is there an actual issue of segregation going on? They tend to do these things kind of blindly and in the moral panic of the summer, many places have taken them up. So that's a fruitful avenue. Another is, is it creating a hostile uh, working or learning environment? Those are still things that are, are important and actionable. And when you write letters, say to a elected official or even to possibly an administrator or when you when you hire an attorney, those are things that, that work, that they understand. Are you being discriminated against? Are they telling you something in your, your education class, for example, that we that well, young black children, young black boys don't respond well to white female teachers because of systemic racism? And so maybe you should consider another profession. You are being discriminated against. It's absurd, but you're still being discriminated against. So that's something you should consider uh, and consider actionable. Uh, and and the, the, the litmus test is consistency. Just switch around some of the identities and see if it's horrible. The second you switch around some identities and if it's horrible then and would be actionable then, the Civil Rights Act doesn't discriminate one way or the other. It's it's across the board equal all directions. Um, another is compelled speech. If people are being compelled to have to sign on to certain statements of belief, I think I didn't get a chance to speak about the, the principle of secularism uh, when I was talking, but it's very important here. The principle of secularism is that you really shouldn't be compelled into any particular way of believing or thinking or doing uh, by some, say, ecclesiastical, if you will, moral authority. And in this case, uh, you should be able to retain the right to believe as you do about racism, for example, that it's not systemic. It's not best understood that way. It's best understood, as Helen very clearly and eloquently described, as a set of really ugly um, beliefs and, and statements and actions that, that people should be discouraged strongly from holding, but that it, it operates on an individual level. And so to say that you have to understand it in a systemic way and you have to make statements about it in a systemic way or that statements are being made on your behalf, saying that people you know, under our imprimatur all accept this, mm -hmm. those kinds of statements very well may constitute um, compelled speech, compelled speech, especially in public sector jobs is, is absolutely not acceptable. So if you're at a public university, that's one thing. It's different at a private university, but private universities are required to make uh, allowances for faith. I don't know if that's true actually for universities, it is for, for private entities. So um, if, if I were a Christian, for example, I can't be compelled to make a statement that's at direct odds with my Christian faith. Uh, and I've been told by a handful of lawyers that that is certainly actionable and it's certainly coming up in a number of ways that Christians and Muslims and Buddhists and, and people of other faiths are being compelled to say things that are at direct odds with their their belief systems. And that that's a that's a thing. Yeah, I guess one. I, I think one that question. that probably is a good way. As well, just concerned because, particularly with the D'Angelo approach, because it is arguing that you cannot be, you, you have been social into this certain belief system and that you cannot think outside it. I think this is something that people with religious faith, particularly as I know Christians, can say, actually, I believe that I do will. You are asking me to affirm that I don't have free will. And that's a religious. Um, 
sort of restriction to me. And I hope that that would also apply to liberal atheists like me who also believe in individual agency, but I'm not sure how well that um, protected under law. <laughs> yeah, I guess I guess one kind of closing question I have for, for each of you here. Um, so I don't know if either of you are uh, familiar with um, Alexander Solzhenitsyn's essay, Live Not By Lies. It's kind of a, a nice little uh, short, brief um essay on kind of how to live under a authoritarian uh, system. And uh, he gives kind of a, a list of advice in there. You know, don't be compelled to go to protest or meetings that you disagree with. Don't subscribe to newspapers and magazines that are lying. Don't uh, sit through lectures that are lying and, and kind of passive ways to kind of, you know, remove yourself from uh, these kind of situations. So, you know, I guess my question to you both is kind of in an actionable sense, what are kind of the, the passive things? Maybe your knowledge isn't quite to the point where you can have a, you know, a long argument about, uh, you know, something like white privilege or critical race theory yet. But what are the passive things people can do um, as soon as they kind of know that this stuff is um, kind of uh, dominating um, whatever they're a part of? Uh, I mean, you listed a number, which is. Uh, the, the best example I, of this. I, I think been, the first thing. Oh, sorry, Helen. Go ahead. Okay, I think we've got a lag going on here. But no, I just want to add. I think the best thing what I had um, stuck with um, pushing back at this is when they have their employer, their university or the school are going to be in a variety of philosophical, religious, ethical um, views. And this um, is, is a, a sort of direct conflict. You're not saying, I don't like it, you have and I won't um, agree with it, but you are a um belief system. I oppose race from a different moral work. Are you going to um, accommodate that? seems to be a, a way in. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that what I saw with the young woman at the restaurant who refused to raise her fist, everybody kind of saw that it became a huge thing of the mob yelling at her to raise her fist mm -hmm. and she wouldn't do it. And then it comes out later that, uh, in fact, she uh, supports and had marched in some of the protests. You know, she supports Black Lives Matter. And that she said that she didn't feel like it was right to do it then because she shouldn't be bullied into or demanded to do it. I think that's incredibly important to remember. Don't be compelled to do something that's against your conscience. Every time you do, you sacrifice some of your authority and people will see it. Every time you sit there and waver for a second, then give in, you have actually not strengthened your case. You have weakened your case. You have given away some of the authority that you would have had to stand up when it gets worse. Um, all of those things you listed about, you know, just politely saying, I don't feel like I want to listen to this. And when they call you white, white fragility or they say, accuse you of white fragility, just accept it. Uh, that's fine. You, or you can even say, I don't accept that. I don't think of that in this way and I'm not going to continue. And to, to remove yourself from those situations and refuse to support those situations is powerful. On a more practical level, when we mentioned, you know, the alumni, uh, alumni tend to give universities a lot of money <laughs> and encouraging them to, to understand the issues and to decide maybe not to give money until things change and to write letters and explain why. Uh, that is the kind of thing that gets administrators' attention. Uh, if you can convince the trustees, if you can convince large alumni donors that maybe it's time not to do that uh, until things become more fair uh, and more open-minded and, and, and more consistent with the mission of the university, then the university will pay attention to that, especially right now. So re removing support one way or another, even tacit support, uh, even in a quiet way is very helpful. Obviously you can also, you don't have, like I said, you don't have to be terribly informed to support people who are and who are trying to speak out. I'm not saying send checks. I'm, I don't care if it's me. If you don't like what I do, don't support me. But find people who are standing up. And if maybe if it's just your friend, maybe if it's just a professor on your campus who's embattled, show up, 
send a letter, you know, a, a letter of support, go sit down and, and take them to lunch, something like that, and just have a chat. Try to make these kind of connections and, and connect with one another. Another very subversive thing, um, and you can see this if you look at the policy about gatherings and groups in China, a very subversive thing is to actually gather. <laughs> make friends with people they tell you you're not allowed to make friends with. You're, you're a faith, you're not supposed to be friends with atheists. You're a conservative, you're not supposed to be friends with liberals. Bull. Make friends, start making networks, talk about these issues, talk about the big picture of philosophy and set <laughs> aside your differences for 10 minutes for a, a common goal. One of the things that's true about diversity is that if you want genuine diversity, it's a value and you want to overcome issues like racism, that you want to get people from different perspectives together and then give them some shared common purpose or goal to work together on. And that overcomes the differences and they form bonds and they can disagree productively across those bonds instead of disagreeing in a poisonous way across the gulf. So unite to talk about the big pictures of the philosophy, uh, to talk about the issue yeah. at hand, to talk about core principles of liberal philosophy and ethics and civics and set aside the differences except to acknowledge, you know, maybe we can talk about these, these things later in a more productive way and we'll be friends when we do it. And I've experienced this myself repeatedly. It's, it's a very effective way to, to reach across difference and have growth and productivity. Uh, so form networks, form networks who are interested, form study groups, literally study groups of this kind that, that want to read our book or read other books about this issue, want to read primary sources and do a book club and try to understand them from a perspective that doesn't just try to, you know, onboard as much of it as possible and invite more people to those as you go. Um, those are actually forming forming groups and networks to, to understand the issue clearly is a very powerfully subversive thing. And you don't have to know much to start one. The point is that you're going to get people together who will learn it together. Uh, and so the resources are starting to become more and more available. So there's plenty of stuff to tap in to do that. <laughs> yes, consciousness. Yeah, they were, we're going to take their tools and turn them back on them. <laughs> That's right. Um, well, you know, James, I'm, I'm so happy you, you mentioned that because uh, a lot of what the Intercollegiate Studies Institute does is, um, you know, helping uh, students connect and make networks and groups and um, understand, uh, you know, a lot of the philosophies that uh, I think can push back on this. So um, thank you both so much for your time today. today. James, I know you have a heart out. so. Yeah, I got to get to the airport. So, you know, uh, everyone, thanks for attending and uh, get the book, Cynical Theories. Um, you know, read it. Uh, it's, it's a useful guide to, to understanding all of this uh, in, in a deeper way and also knowing how to act um, and how to respond to this stuff, uh, you know, in your workplace or at your university or wherever, whatever institution you find yourself in. So um, thank you both so much. and. Um, Looking forward to, you know, uh, seeing, you know, the great work you're doing, Bear Some Fruit, um, uh, in the next few months. So, so. thanks great. so much. Yeah, thank you.